Welcome to A.A. Shah Zayas Institute. This is our fifth lecture in the series on India since independence by Bhupan Chandra. So in this we are going to discuss chapter number 9 which is consolidation of India as a nation 3, integration of tribals. So our strategy is that we will be highlighting the important points, important sentences in the chapter which are the gist of the entire chapter. So if you read that you can understand the entire topic and get the important points plus also it is very good for revision. So here we start with, it says the 1971 census recorded over 400 tribal communities numbering nearly 38 million people. 38 million means 3 crore 80 lakh people because 1 million means 10 lakh. So these many people constituting nearly 6.9% of the Indian population were tribals. So there were around 400 tribal communities and spread all, they were spread all over India. Their greatest concentration was in Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, Odisha, Northeastern India, West Bengal, Maharashtra, Gujarat and Rajasthan. Except in the Northeast, they constituted minorities in their home states. And in most part of the country, colonialism had brought radical transformation of the tribals as their relative isolation was eroded by the penetration of market forces and they were integrated with the British and princely administrations. So earlier tribals was, uh, were a separate class in itself but then after British rule, during British rule and during the administration of princely states as such too, market forces had penetrated there. And a large number of money lenders, traders, revenue farmers and other middlemen and petty officials had invaded the tribal area and disrupted the tribal's traditional way of life. They were increasingly engulfed in debt and lost their lands to outsiders often being reduced to the position of agricultural laborers, sharecroppers and rack rented tenants. Means they were in a cycle of debt and they had to had, had become tenants on their own land. So that was the situation during British rule. Also simultaneously missionaries were destroying their art, their dance, their weaving and their whole culture. So missionaries were also working in the tribal regions and they were losing, the tribals were losing on their culture as such too. To conserve the forest and to facilitate their commercial exploitation, colonial authorities also brought large tracts of forest land under forest, forest laws, which forbade shifting cultivation and even put severe restrictions on tribal's use of the forest and the access to forest produce. So presently in India, we have a Forest Rights Act where minor, minor forest produce can be taken by tribals. So they have access to that. So loss of land, indebtedness, exploitation by middlemen, denial of access to forest and forest products, oppression by policemen, forest officials, etc. led to tribal uprisings. So most prominent of them were the Santhal uprisings and the Munda rebellion which took place uh, led by Birsa Munda. So these were the tribal uprisings which we study in history as such too. So this was during the colonial rule. So roots of Indians, Indian tribal policies discussed here. You can see the preservation of tribal people's rich social and cultural heritage lay at the heart of government's policy of tribal integration. So though tribal integration should take place, but their social and cultural heritage also should be preserved is the objective of the government of India. The first Prime Minister, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru favored the policy of integrating the tribal people in Indian society, of making them an integral part of the Indian nation even while maintaining their distinct identity and culture. So there were two basic parameters of Nehruvian approach in the tri in tri on tribal policy that the tribal areas have to progress and they have to progress in their own way. So Nehru stood for economic and social development of the tribal people, especially in the fields of communication, modern medical facilities, agriculture, education. So in this regard, he laid down certain broad guidelines for government policy for tribals. But also tribals uh, right to land and forest should be respected and it was said no outsider should be able to take possession of tribal lands. So this was the government policy. That they should develop at their own pace and no outsider should take possession. Thirdly, also government policy stated that it was necessary to encourage tribal languages. So they must also be safeguarded. And fourth, administrators should be recruited from amongst them and trained. And fifth, there should be no over administration of tribals. Effort should be to administer and develop tribals through them, their own social and cultural institutions. So no imposing as such. So Nehru's approach was in turn based on the nationalistic policy towards tribals since the 1920s even when Gandhiji had set up ashrams in tribal areas and promoted constructive work. So that was the government policy and is the basis of government policy 
on tribal issues. Article 46 of the constitution also says uh, that is under the directive principles of state policy that state should promote with special care the education and economic interests of the tribal people and should protect them from social injustice and all forms of exploitation through special legislation. So that is also there. So, Article 46 is for scheduled castes, scheduled tribes and also for weaker sections of the society. So, their educational uh, and social development, educational economic interests have to be safeguarded. Then, this is in spite of the constitutional safeguard and efforts of the central and state governments, the tribal's progress and welfare has been very slow and even dismal. Except in the northeast, the tribals continue to be poor, indebted, landless and often unemployed. So that's true. So though we have reservation for SC, ST, VC in case of ST, the seats still remain vacant. The, 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 com the community has not come to the fore as much as is expected. So state governments have also been relatively ineffective in administering the positive policies and laws laid down by the central government or by the state governments themselves. So there has been a lag here. A major handicap from which tribals suffer is denial of justice, often because of their unfamiliarity with the laws and the legal system. Rapid extension of mines and industries has worsened their condition in many areas. The progress of education among the tribals has also been disappointingly slow. Tribal societies almost everywhere has also begun been gradually developing class differences and a class structure with those belonging to the upper caste often joining forces with the upper caste of the outsiders. Further, the major gains of whatever development takes place in the fields of education, employment and administration, economy and political patronage are reaped by the small segment of the tribal elites, which has slowly emerged and grown. So this is also an issue which we are facing presently to the way we have creamy layer in OBCs. Should there be creamy layer in SC and ST is a question. So here you can see Vipanchaja speaks of tribal elites too. So wherever there is reservation, they take up the benefits and the general tribal population for whom the benefits are intended do not benefit out of it. Then here we come about uh, discussing about tribals in the northeast. So British policy in the late 19th century for the Assam province, it was that it had a deliberate policy of excluding the outsiders from the place. So this was a deliberate policy of the Britishers in Assam province. So in particular, no non-tribal plainsmen were allowed to acquire land in the tribal areas because of which tribals suffered little loss of land. So tribals did not suffer loss of land. But at the same time, British government permitted and even encouraged Christian missionaries to move in and establish schools, hospitals and churches. Churches and to proselytize means to preach the religion, Christian religion, uh, Christianity. Thus introducing change and modern ideas among some of the tribal youth. Missionaries also helped keep, keep the nationalist influence out of the tribal areas. So that was the British policy in tribal areas. After independence, the sixth schedule of the constitution up, uh, has been formulated, which applies to tribal areas. So tribal areas of Assam, Meghalaya, and Tripura and Mizoram. So at that time, it was Assam as such, to which tri for which for tribal areas here there were special provisions in the constitution. Then it was actually other uh, states like. Uh, out of Assam, NEFA, that is North East Frontier Agency, was created in 1948. So it was from the border areas of Assam. And this became a union territory outside the jurisdiction of Assam and was placed under special administration. And this is NEFA, which was later renamed as Arunachal Pradesh and became a separate state also in 1987. Then hill tribes of Assam, which had no cultural affinity with Assamese and Bengali residents of the plains, they there also problem arose because tribals were afraid of losing their identity and being assimilated by what was with some justification seen to be a policy of Assamization. So this was also been seen as a problem in Assam. So NEFA was developing comfortably in harmony with the rest of the country. But in other tribal areas of Assam, problems emerged. So this was a problem seen with hill tribes of Assam. So plains, people living in the plains and people living in the hills of Assam, they had differences. So they were they, if they are uh, combined together, then they lose their identity. So the plains, population of the plains were dominant. So it was felt there was Assamization taking place that the hill tribes of Assam, uh, they were losing their cultural identity. That was the fear. So demand for a separate hill state arose among some sections of the tribal people in the mid 1950s because they did not want Assamization to take over their culture. 
So the demand gra gained greater strength when Assamese leaders moved in 1960 towards making Assamese the sole official language of the state. So that was the fear. And that came from that Assamese was declared as was demanded to be made the sole official language of the state. So that time the hill tribes again became uh, adamant on demanding a separate state. So this is how states have been formed in the northeastern region too. One which we already saw is Nepal, which became Arunachal Pradesh as a separate state carved out of Assam. Then in 1969, through a constitutional amendment, Meghalaya was also carved out of Assam as a state within a state, which had complete autonomy except for law and order, which remained a function of Assam government. Finally, Meghalaya also became a separate state in 1972. So Meghalaya comprises of region which includes Garo, Khasi and Jaintia hills and these are the places where these tribes are present. So it incorporated Garo, Khasi and Jaintia tribes. Simultaneously, union territories were formed of Manipur and Tripura which were granted statehood later. So the transition to statehood in case of Meghalaya, Manipur, Tripura and Arunachal Pradesh was smooth. But trouble arose in the case of Nagaland and Mizoram where secessionist and ins insurrectionary movements developed. So out of northeastern states you can see Arunachal Pradesh has been formed, Meghalaya has been formed and even Manipur and Tripura have been formed. But two states formed in the northeast which created trouble were Nagaland and Mizoram. So we'll discuss them. First, Nagaland. So Naga Hills. Many separate tribes speaking different languages uh, were present here. So Naga Hills along, were along the northeast frontier on the Assam Burma border. And nearly 5 lakh Nagas were inhabiting this and they constituted less than 0.1 percentage of Indian population. But they consisted of many separate tribes speaking different languages. And policy of integration of Naga areas with the state of Assam and India as a whole was being pursued immediately after independence. But this integration was opposed and rebellion was initiated in Nagaland under the leadership uh, in the Naga region under the leadership of AZ Fizo. And the demand was separation from India. They demanded complete independence. And government of India responded to this with a two track policy. It completely opposed secessionist demands that they should be they would be given independence and they initiated conciliation and winning over the naga population so state of nagaland was finally formed in 1963 but the insurgency continued so it was brought to uh, into control to some extent but guerrilla activities by naga rebels trained in china pakistan and myanmar continued and periodic terrorist attacks continued till the naga issue has still not been resolved we have seen the uh, the Actually, there have been these uh, agreements which have been signed even with, by the, with the present government, but final conclusion of this has still not taken place. So we see NSCN, NSCN IM, NSCNK, Naga Socialist Con uh, no, uh, National Socialist Council of Nagaland, NSCN. There are two factions, NSCN IM, NSCNK, and there are other factions too, but these are the two major ones. And uh, Though Modi government in 9, 2015 also signed a ceasefire agreement, but final conclusion has still not taken place and the dispute still continues. So that is that because all of them don't come on board. They also take uh, refuge in adjoining country of Myanmar and that is also an issue and they continue guerrilla tactics and attacks from there. Record of Indian Army in Nagaland, it is said, has been on the whole clean, but its behavior has sometimes been improper in rare cases, even brutal. But then they also uh, they also fight in tough situations. They have paid a heavy price through loss of their soldiers and officers, officers in guerrilla attacks here. So that is the Naga issue. So though Nagaland has been formed as a separate state, but insurgents still continue to fight as the original demand was of cessation. And still also NSCN factions, these insurgent groups, they are demanding a separate flag, a separate constitution. So the dispute is still not resolved. Then next is about Mizoram. So Mizo district as such uh, was also uh, an autonomous district in the northeast. But then the unhappiness with the Assam government's relief measures during the famine in 1959 was an issue which had resulted in unrest here. Also, the passage of the Act in 1961, which made Assamese the official language of the state, resulted in Mizos also raising a demand and they formed Mizo National Front, MNF, with Laldenga as its president. So, this was immediate consequence of the 1961 Act of Assam, making Assamese the official language. So, you can see an MNF, Mizo National Front, was also had a military wing. 
which received arms and ammunition and military training from East Pakistan and China. East Pakistan at that time was present day Bangladesh. So they received training here in March 1966, MNF declared independence from India and proclaimed a military uprising and attacked military and civilian targets. Government of India responded with immediate massive counterinsurgency measures by the army. So though the secessionist activities at that time were controlled, the guerrilla attacks continued. And in 1973, Mizo district of Assam was separated from Assam and Mizoram was formed as a union territory. Eventually, Mizoram also became a state in 1987. So these were the two northeastern states with tribal population where the issues finally have been resolved. So insurgent attacks still continue as we see in case of Nagaland. And this is regarding Jharkhand. So Jharkhand is the tribal area of Bihar. So it consists of Chhota Nagpur. Uh, now, presently, it is a separate state, but it was actually the tribal areas of Bihar. It has been carved out of Bihar. So, it consists of Chota Nagpur and Santhal Parganas, which have for decades spawned movements for state autonomy. And in this area are concentrated several major tribes of India, namely Santhal, Ho, Aran, and Munda. So, these are the tribes from Jharkhand. It is said nearly two thirds of Jharkhand's population in 1971 was non tribal. An overwhelming majority of both tribals and non-tribals were equally exploited poor peasants, agricultural laborers and mining and industry workers. So two-third population is non-tribal, only one-third is tribal, but all of them are equally exploited. They are poor peasants, laborers, industry workers and exploited. So inequality in land holding and money lender men is equally prevalent among the two and commercialization of agriculture and commercial activity makes them suffer. So that was the issue in this region. So, realizing that the interests of the tribal people could be best promoted and their domination by non tribals ended if they have a state of their own within the union, Jharkhand party was formed. So, this was a party found in 1950 under the leadership of Oxford edu educated Jaipal Singh. But the Jharkhand party faced a major dilemma. While it demanded a state where the tribal people would predominate, the population composition of Jharkhand was such that they would still constitute a minority within Jharkhand. So, as we saw, two third was non tribal. So, it tried to give its demand a regional character by opening its membership to non-tribals of the area and underplaying its anti-non-tribal rhetoric. Even while it talked of empowerment of tribals and their dominance in, of an, the, the dominance in a new state, but still it uh, brought in non-tribals along too. The State Reorganization Commission in 1955 rejected this demand for separate Jharkhand state on the ground that region did not have a common language. So at that time we see demands of separate states were formed based on the basis of language. So there was no common language in Dharkhand. So that is where state reorganization rejected, the commission rejected this demand. In 1963, a major part of the leadership of the party, including Jaipal Singh, joined Congress, claiming that by working from within Congress, it stood a better chance of getting its demand for a separate state accepted by the government. So this resulted at that time, the issue being ended. But then Jharkhand Mukti Morcha, JMM was formed in late 1972. And this year they began, the JMM began to assert that all the older residents of Jharkhand region, whether tribal or non-tribal were exploited, discriminated against and dominated by North Bihar and the recent migrants. So this was Jharkhand Mukti Morcha formed and Shibu Soren emerged as the charismatic leader of JMM during the early 1970s. So tribals, non-tribals they all came together so tri tribal society itself was also not homogeneous it contained landlords rich peasants traders and money landers but however for various reasons Jharkhand finally came into existence as a separate state on 15 November 2000 and Jharkhand was formed along with two other new states from Jharkhand was carved out of Bihar Chhattisgarh out of Madhya Pradesh and Uttarakhand now Uttarakhand, originally it was Uttaranchal, the later renamed Uttarakhand was created out of Uttar Pradesh. So all these three states were given separate state status on 1st and uh, 15th, 1st November, 9th November and 15th November 2000. So these were states formed, even tribal state of Jharkhand being formed is what we saw. So this ends our chapter 9. Next we will see chapter 10 in the next lecture. Thank you.